The first time I met Kobe Bryant, my life changed forever. See, back in 2007, Nike flew me out to Los Angeles to work the first ever Kobe Bryant Skills Academy. Nike brought in the top high school and college players from around the country for an intense three-day minicamp with the best player in the world. And for any of you that don't follow basketball as closely as I do, just know that in 2007, Kobe was the best player in the game. Well, an important fact about me is basketball was my first identifiable passion, my first love. I fell in love with the game at five years old, and I'm so grateful that here, four decades later, basketball is still a major pillar of my life. And having grown up so closely around the game, I'd always heard this urban legend of how insanely intense Kobe's individual workouts were. Well, when I found myself on his camp staff, I figured this is my chance. This is my shot. So my earliest opportunity, I walked up to Kobe and asked if I could watch one of his private workouts. He was incredibly gracious. He smiled and he said, sure, man, no problem. I'm going tomorrow at 4. Well, I got a little bit confused because I had just got done looking through the camp schedule and the camp schedule clearly said that the first workout with the players was the following day at 3.30. Oh, you, oh, sorry. It was the, the, the workout the following day at 3.30. And then Kobe looked at me and clarified that with, yeah, that's 4 a.m. Well, I couldn't think of a legitimate reason of why I couldn't be somewhere at 4 in the morning, so I basically committed myself to being there, and I figured if I'm going to be there anyway, I may as well try and impress Kobe. I may as well leave my mark and show him how serious of a trainer I was. So I came up with the plan to beat him to the gym. So I set my alarm for 3 a.m. The next morning, the alarm goes off, I jump up, I quickly get myself dressed, and I hop in a cab, and I head to the gym. Now, when I arrive, it's 3.30 in the morning, so it's pitch black outside. And yet, the moment I step out of that cab, I could see that the gym light was already on. From the parking lot, I could faintly hear a ball bouncing, and sneakers squeaking. I walk in the side door of the gym. Kobe's already in a full sweat. See, he was going through an intense warm-up before his formal workout with his trainer started at 4. Well, out of professional courtesy, I didn't say anything to Kobe, and I didn't say anything to his trainer. I just sat down to watch. And for the first 45 minutes, I was shocked. For the first 45 minutes, I watched the best player in the world do the most basic footwork and offensive moves. Kobe was doing stuff that I had routinely taught to middle school age players. Now don't get it twisted, this was Kobe Bryant, so he was doing everything with an unparalleled level of intensity and was doing everything with surgical precision. But the stuff he was doing was incredibly basic. Well, his workout went on for a couple more hours, and when it was over, once again, I did not say anything to him. I did not say anything to his trainer. I just quietly left. But my curiosity kept nipping away, and it eventually overwhelmed me to the point that I had to know. So later that day at camp, I went up to Kobe again and said, I don't understand. You're the best player in the world. Why are you doing such basic drills? And he flashed that million-dollar smile. He gave me a very friendly wink, but he said in a very serious tone, why do you think I'm the best player in the world? Because I never get bored with the basics. I never get bored with the basics. Kobe Bryant, the best player on the planet, and someone that has truly mastered his craft, said that his entire secret is that he never got bored with the basics. And as obvious as that may be to you all right now, that was a life-changing moment for me. See, in that moment, I finally realized that just because something is basic, it doesn't mean that it's easy. Those are not synonyms, and yet people mistakenly use those words as if they're interchangeable. Just because it's basic, it doesn't mean it's easy. If it was easy, everyone else would be doing it. And you all know that we live in a world that tells us unconsciously that it's okay to skip steps. Tells us we should always be looking for a shortcut or a hack. 
tells us we should constantly be chasing what's new and what's shiny and what's flashy and what's sexy. But I'm here to tell you, when you do those things, you are making a huge mistake. And that's because the basics work. They always have and they always will. And the very first step to improving performance in any area of your life, it doesn't matter if it's personal or professional, it doesn't matter if it's individual or organizational, but the very first step is to admit that the basics work. But it's also having the humility to acknowledge that implementing the basics every single day is never ever going to be easy. Now my goal for being with you all today is also very basic. I wanna add as much value to your lives as I possibly can in our very short time together. See, if you were in this room right now, I consider you a high performer. And one thing I know for certain, having spent my entire life around elite level high performers, is high performers are looking to grow. They're looking to develop. They're looking to evolve. They're looking to improve. High performers are always looking for that edge. And ultimately, that's why I'm here today, to help give you that edge. And I'm going to tell you a few stories, and I'm going to give you a few stats. But more importantly, I'm going to give you a, a handful of practical and actionable ideas and concepts that every single one of you can implement immediately with you and your teams to improve your personal influence and impact, to work towards becoming the best version of yourself so that you can make a maximum contribution to everyone and everything around you. But in order to do that, I need you all to stay open-minded to raising your clarity in three very specific areas. Your perspective, your core values, and your purpose. And I don't know of anyone that lives these three things better than your morning keynote speaker, uh, Jordan Montgomery. Your perspective, your core values, and your purpose. So let's take a look at each of those. Your perspective, primarily your perspective on leadership. And I want to highly encourage each and every one of you to adopt the foundational mantra of transformational leadership, which is choosing to see the world through the lens of it's not about me, it's about you. It's not about me, it's about you. You should be able to look every single member of your family in the eye, your spouses, your significant others, and your children, and say, it's not about me, it's about you. You should be able to look every single member of your team in the eye and say, it's not about me, it's about you. And you absolutely, both individually and organizationally, need to look every single one of your customers in the eye and be able to say, it's not about me, it's about you. When you shift the focus off of what you want from people, and you shift it to what you want for people, you become the most magnetic leader in any room immediately. And one mantra that I know for sure and I try and live by, and is, is a sound mantra for leadership, is that a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. And ultimately, as leaders, that's the job we're in. We're here to light other people's candles, and you're absolutely here to light the candles of those on your team and those that you serve. So first and foremost is our perspective. Second are your core values. What do you believe in? What do you stand for? What are the non-negotiables that you use to make the most important decisions in your life? See, when you can get crystal clear on your core values, it actually makes decision-making so much more fluid. This doesn't mean you won't still have really hard decisions to make, but it means now you have a framework to make that process more fluid. Because every single decision that you make, you run through the filter of, is this in alignment with my core values or not? If the answer is yes, it's in alignment with your core values, then you can do it with a smile and with no hesitation. However, if the answer is no, if this is not in alignment with the person that I'm trying to become, then at the very least, I would hope you'd take a beat Take a breath before you proceed. And don't forget, as leaders, your team can't become something that you're not. 
And you can't lead your team somewhere you're not personally going yourself. And when you learn to make decisions based on your core values and standards, instead of the roller coaster of emotions and feelings that we all experience as human beings, when you make decisions based on standards and core values, now you become the most consistent person in any room. And when it comes to leadership, consistency matters. So we have our perspective, we have our core values, and now let's take a look at our purpose. The purpose behind the work that you do. And don't confuse function with purpose. The, the, the function of that chair you're sitting in is to provide somewhere for you to sit. The purpose of that chair is to provide you comfort. One has a much deeper meaning than the other. And it's so important that you all as leaders stay deeply connected to the purpose of your work, but more importantly, you make that contagious. You make sure every single member of your team, regardless of title or tenure, stays connected to the purpose of the work that you all do. When you can make that happen, you increase buy-in and you cr increase believe in. One of the best groups that I've ever seen do this on an organizational level at a massive scale is DHL, the International Shipping and Logistics Goliath. DHL goes to great lengths to make sure every member of their team stays connected to their purpose. Now for context, DHL has a presence in every single country in the world and they have hundreds of thousands of team members. And they make sure that every single member of that team stays connected to their purpose. And their purpose is we don't deliver brown boxes, we deliver promises. We don't deliver brown boxes, we deliver promises. They go to great lengths to make sure that a, a new employee that's working in a remote city in a remote country, who's working the graveyard shift at the warehouse, who is literally stacking brown box after brown box on a truck after truck, they make sure that person knows that's not a brown box you're putting on a truck. That's a little kid's birthday gift you're putting on a truck. That's not a brown box you're putting on a truck. That's a future bride's wedding dress you're putting on a truck. That's not a brown box you're putting on a truck. That's somebody's medicine you're putting on a truck. They make sure that every single member of that team stays deeply connected to the fact that the work they do is incredibly important. And when you, and your, when you can make your team stay highly connected to your purpose, then you become the most inspirational person in that room. And inspiration matters when it comes to your leadership. I had the great fortune of, of starting to work with and meet Kevin Durant when he was 15 years old. And I watched Kevin play basketball as a sophomore for about five minutes, and I came to the following conclusion. Number one, this kid loves to play basketball. It was a hot summer day, and he was playing his tail off, but he had a smile from ear to ear. Number two, this kid is fundamentally sound. He had pristine footwork and shooting mechanics, especially for someone his age. Number three, Kevin had a very high basketball IQ. He understood the game on a cerebral level that would rival most coaches. And number four, Kevin was a little bit slight of frame back then. He used to get really irritated with me when I would call him skinny, but Kevin was slight of frame. And it was obvious to me that the only thing that could prevent this young man from playing the game at a very high level would be lack of strength and power. Well, that was music to my ears because that's exactly what I did. I was a basketball strength and conditioning coach. So the thought that I may have something that this young man needed to get to the next level really excited me. And, and it took a little bit of convincing. It actually took almost three months for me to convince Kevin's mom, Wanda, to let her baby boy come in for a workout. Because at that point, he had never gone through any type of structured strength and conditioning workout. And I think over those three months, there was just so much buildup that I got a little bit too amped up. Because within about 20 minutes of that workout, I hammered him. Within 20 minutes, Kevin was laying in a pile on the gym floor. Well, he was 6'11", 180 pounds at the time, so he was more coiled up like a garden hose, but he was, he was on the gym floor, and he was shaking, and he was sweating profusely. And Kevin was a very shy young man back then. He didn't say two words the entire workout. So I wanted to get some feedback. So I looked down at him and asked if he liked the workout. 
And he looked up and as serious as can be, said, no, I didn't. But I know this is what I need to do if I wanna make it to the NBA. So when can I see you again, coach? And I remember being blown away at the maturity of this young man, that he was willing to lean into discomfort, he was willing to lean into sacrifice, but most importantly, he was willing to make a change. He was willing to change and make a sacrifice from what he wanted in that moment to what he wanted most of all. And there's three areas that I wanna highly encourage each and every one of you, look to make changes so that you can continue to level up and become the best version of yourself so that you can maximize your contribution to everyone and everything around you. Now, because you're in this room and you guys are already elite high performers, most likely these aren't going to be massive sweeping changes. These are going to be small, incremental, systematic, progressive changes. And there's three areas that I want you to consider leveling up to be the best version of yourself. The first are your habits. Second is your mindset. And third is your focus. So let's take a look at your habits. The things you do unconsciously and the things you do consistently. There was a Duke University study that found that 42% of everything we do during our waking hours is habitual. Think about that. That means almost half of everything we do from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed has been set on autopilot. Each and every one of us has grooved a series of repeatable, predictable behaviors because they, they now give us comfort. I've already established that you guys are high performers. That is my evaluation of you. But I have a very important question to ask you. It's a rhetorical question that I'd like to ask each and every one of you. Are you a high performer because of your habits? Or are you a high performer in spite of your habits? If you were to list every single thing you do on a daily basis, what percentage of those things are helping you and what percentage of those things are hindering you? If you were to literally write down the things you do every single day of your life, what percentage of those things are taking you closer to the person that you strive to become and what percentage of those things are holding you back and dragging you down like an anchor? And let me just say this, don't worry about perfection. Life is not a perfect game. And please know that every single thing I share on stage and every single thing I share on page is not coming from a place of mastery. I'm still trying to figure this stuff out just like you guys are. What I can say with a huge smile and a tremendous amount of pride is I like the progress that I've made and I like the path that I'm on. And that's my sincere hope for each and every one of you. Don't worry about where you are right now in this moment. Focus more on the direction that you're going. And as long as your personal arrow is pointed up or pointed forward, even if it's at a very slight grade, you're moving in the right direction, and that's what's most important. If you're looking for an actionable exercise on how you can actually tighten this up, here's something you can sit with over the next few days. I'm going to give you these instructions pretty quick. You take out a piece of paper, you draw a vertical line down the middle. On the left side of the paper, you make an exhaustive list of the things that fill your bucket. The things that light you up, that make you smile, that you enjoy doing, the things that feed your energy. These could be things for your physical, your mental, your emotional, or your spiritual well-being. But you come up with a list of the things that nourish your soul and make you feel alive. Then on the right side of the paper, I want you to write down how you've been spending the bookends of your day. How have you been spending the first 60 minutes after you wake up and the last 60 minutes before you go to bed? And I want you to be honest. And, and, and if you do this with some honesty and some vulnerability, which takes a little bit of courage, even the highest performer in this room will start to uncover what's called a performance gap. And a performance gap is the gap between what we know we should do and what we actually do. It is literally the gap between the things we all know we should do to be the best version of ourselves and to make a maximum contribution to everyone and everything around us and what we actually do in the mornings and evenings. And the very first step to improving your productivity, to improving your performance, to improving your impact, to improving your contribution, to improving your fulfillment, the very first step is learning how to close that gap. 
is taking some of the things on the left side of the paper and sprinkling them in on the right side of the paper. The things that charge you up, feed you, you know, fill your bucket, you start taking those things from the left side and you care enough about yourself and those that you serve that you start sprinkling those in to your morning and your evening routine. I can promise you, without fail, if you start doing that consistently, you will see performance start to skyrocket immediately. In fact, nothing else is even possible. So those are our habits. Now let's talk about mindset, which I believe is the biggest separator when it comes to business. Your perspective on the world around you. And I want to encourage and empower each and every one of you to adopt what I call the winner's mindset. And that is waking up every day with the self-commitment that I'm going to do the best I can with what I have wherever I am. Full stop. I'm going to do the best I can with what I have wherever I am. The reason I love this as a, as a mantra, or I'll even call it a definition of mental toughness, is it automatically eliminates a trilogy of behaviors that will undermine your performance, undermine your productivity, undermine your impact, undermine your contribution, and will undermine your fulfillment. And I know all these from personal experience. And that trilogy of behaviors is blaming, complaining, and making excuses. I use absolutes very sparingly, but you will never, ever, Improve your life or make your situation better by blaming, complaining, or making excuses. So the sooner we as leaders can work to reduce, if not completely eliminate, blaming, complaining, and making excuses, it is like taking an emotional weight vest off. You become so much more emotionally agile. And you know what you are if you're not emotionally agile? You're emotionally fragile. And you simply can't be a high performer yourself or you can't lead other high performers or a high performing team or organization if you are emotionally fragile. So that's our mindset. And now let's take a look at focus. Or what I'm actually going to call the ability to refocus the lens. I don't know in today's day and age if it's a realistic expectation for us to have long periods of uninterrupted, sustained focus. We just have too many things vying for our attention. A good portion of those things are the, those devices in our pockets that many people tend to be tethered to 24-7. We have so many things vying for our attention. So we have to learn how to be able to refocus the lens. And the first step to being able to do that is having a level of awareness. You will never improve something you're unaware of. You will never fix something you're oblivious to. So you know how you improve your ability to be focused? You have the self-awareness to know when you're unfocused, when you're distracted, when your mind wanders, when you're not present. So what is it that I want you to be focused on? I heard an acronym a decade ago from former Notre Dame football coach Lou Holtz. And that acronym is WIN, W-I-N, and it stands for What's Important Now. This is a very powerful recalibration tool. This is something that I say to myself dozens of times over the course of a day. What's important now? In any given moment of any given day, you should be able to take a deep breath and ask yourself, am I choosing to place my attention in what I believe is most deserving of it in this moment? You literally take a beat, take an inventory, and ask yourself, am I choosing to place my attention in what I believe is most deserving of it in the moment? And that answer will be different for everybody in the room at different times. But I'm a huge believer that how you do anything is how you do everything. If you're sitting down to meet with a prospective customer, they deserve your full attention. But if you're sitting down with your family at the end of the day for family dinner, they absolutely deserve your full attention. So you have to ask yourself in that moment, what's most important now? Ultimately, what I'm talking about is the ability to be dialed into the present moment. Another phrase that I love that I use constantly with myself, I heard this from both Nick Saban 
the head football coach at Alabama. I also heard this from Oprah, and I figure if both of those people are saying it, it has to be true. And that is we all have to learn how to be where our feet are. Learn to be where your feet are. Wherever your feet are, make sure that's where your head and your heart are as well. How many of you have ever been with someone? You weren't with someone. You might have been in the room in body, but you cer certainly weren't there with mind, heart, or spirit. In order to be a high performer and to be your best in any given moment, we need to get all of our faculties in alignment. We need all of our faculties in the present moment. Now, there's a more expanded list of what it takes to be in the present moment, and that consists of three things. Number one, learn to refocus the lens on the next play. Number two, learn to refocus the lens on what you have control over. And number three, learn to refocus the lens on the process. So let's take a look at next play. When I was serving as the basketball performance coach in my career before this, in addition to helping players improve their on-court physicality and athleticism, my number one job was to get our players to play present, which means to be dialed into the present moment. And a cornerstone of that is getting them to focus quickly on the next play. Why would I want my players focused on the next play? There's nothing they can do about the play that just happened. It's over. It's in the rearview mirror. It's in the past. It's unchangeable. So I need them to quickly refocus on the next play. You just missed a wide open layup. It's okay. Next play. You just turned the ball over. It's okay. Next play. Yes, Jordan, I know. The referee didn't make a call. It happens sometimes in basketball. Next play. Why do I want my players focused on the next play? There's absolutely nothing they can do about that turnover, that missed shot, or that referee's inability to make the call. That play is in the past, it's in the rear view mirror, it is over, it is unchangeable. And any mental, physical, or emotional currency they waste worried about something in the past that can't be changed means they don't have that emotional currency to pour into the present moment, which means by definition, they cannot be at their best. And if you do follow elite level basketball, what happens if this gentleman chooses, choose being the key word, chooses after he makes a mistake to get in his feelings and to hang his head and slouch his shoulders and to slowly jog back on defense. What happens in the game of elite level basketball? His man just scores two points on the other end and either a layup or a dunk, the easiest shot in the game of basketball. He just turned a two point mistake into a four point mistake. And as high-performing leaders creating high-performing and winning teams, mistakes are going to happen. They're going to happen every single day to every single one of us. There's nothing wrong with mistakes, but we can't be in the business of compounding them, and we absolutely can't be in the business of repeating them. So we have to quickly move to the next play. Now let's talk about the second component, which is what we have control over. We call this control the controllables. And I'm from the belief that there's only two things in this world we have 100% control over 100% of the time. That's our own effort and our own attitude. I don't want this to be a game of verbal semantics. Yes, you can take some effort and attitude, mix them up, and you have preparation. You're in control of how well prepared you are for any given scenario. And you can take some effort and attitude, mix them together, and you have enthusiasm. You're in control of how enthusiastic you choose to be at any given moment of any given day. But those are really just spokes off of the same wheel. We're still ultimately just talking about effort and attitude. And here's the thing with effort. I know that if I sat down, once again, with each and every one of you, and I asked you if working hard was a choice, that any time you gave a great effort, was that because you chose to give a great effort? You would nod an affirmation. You would acknowledge, because working hard is a choice. I agree with you 100%. But if working hard is a choice, there has to be another side of that coin. If working hard is a choice, then not working hard, that's also a choice. And it can't be one that we choose to make very consistently if we want to be the best versions of ourselves and if we want to make a maximum contribution to everyone and everything around us. We need to make the choice to give the best effort we're capable of as consistently as we're capable of. And when we do that as leaders, then we can expect that of our team. I don't believe you can expect something of your team that you don't expect of yourself. 
I don't believe you can ask members of your team to do things you're not willing to do yourself. So before you can hold anyone on your team accountable to giving a great effort, you need to make sure that you are doing that to the best of your ability. The second half of that is attitude. And for the most part, when I look at attitude, I think the most important aspect of that is having a level of acceptance and surrender to the fact that we do not control the events and circumstances and what people say and what people do. We don't have control over any of that. But each and every one of us controls our response to those things. So let's spend less time worrying about events and circumstances and what other people say and do and put all of our attention into having thoughtful, intentional, forward-moving responses. We don't control the events, we control our responses. That's the half of the equation that we need to make sure we focused on. And that's what it comes down to attitude. The best attitudes in the world are the people that acknowledge, I don't control this, I do control this, and that's what I'm going to focus on. And now the third step, let's talk about refocusing the lens on the process. It's great to have goals. It's great to have outcomes. I think every single person in this room should have a North Star because that's gonna help give you some clarity on the direction that you need to go. But I'm a big believer that once you've decided on your goal or your North Star, you can take your eyes off of it and you can put it on the process, the daily behaviors, the micro skills, the decisions that you make on a daily basis to inch you closer to that. The best example I can think of, which I think is very appropriate for this group, is if you're tasked with building a brick wall, don't worry so much about the wall. Pay a lot more attention to the bricks. I'm not very handy, I'm not very good at building stuff, but even I have the discipline to take one brick and set it exactly where it needs to go. And then take another brick and set it exactly where it needs to go. And if I lay each brick with care and precision and I do that consistently, the wall will eventually take care of itself. That's an adage in sports that Bill Walsh, the, the Hall of Fame coach for the 49ers, used to say. The scoreboard will take care of itself if you focus on the process. I learned this firsthand, these traits of next play, controlling the controllables in the process. In 2017, I was invited to, to be a part of an um, extreme fitness event at the home of Jesse Itzler and Sarah Blakely. If you don't know who they are, Jesse is a serial entrepreneur, a very successful entrepreneur, an unbelievable speaker and author, and an endurance superhuman. His wife, Sarah Blakely, is the founder of Spanx, a women's undergarment company. And she once laid claim to being the youngest self-made female billionaire in the world. So a very high-performing couple. And they invited 100 of us to their home in New Fairfield, Connecticut. And the backyard of their home was a patch of grass that was 80 yards long, so almost the length of a football field, and was at a 40 degree slope. I don't know if any of you have ever done some incline work on a conventional gym treadmill, but a gym treadmill only goes up to 15%. And if you ever put it up to 15% to go for a walk on a treadmill, you feel like you're gonna fall off the back of the earth. And this was at 40%. 80 yards long, 40% grade. And our task for that day was to run up and down that hill 100 times. That event was appropriately called Hell on the Hill, and that it was. Around rep 70, I hit a massive wall. I was fried. I was done, mentally and physically. I could feel blisters forming under my big toes. My knees and my back were throbbing. And I apologize for the visual because I know you guys just ate, but I had a chafing situation that was absolutely out of this world. And I was ready to quit. I was done. I'm very grateful that I had a friend who was running. His name's Steve Wojciechowski, Duke basketball legend and former head coach at Marquette. And I knew that Steve and I were running at about the same pace. So to commiserate in misery, I asked him how many reps he had left. And he smiled, which really irritated me. And he said, I've got one rep. One rep, there's no way you have. And then he finished his sentence. I have one rep 30 more times. That is the epitome of being in the present moment. 
So you don't worry about the end result. You don't worry about the hundred. You just have to worry about getting up and down that hill one more time. You just focus on the next play. You take your mind off of your blisters and your knees and your back and your chafing situation and you put it on your own effort and your own attitude. And you don't worry about the North Star or the end goal or the completion of 100. You focus on the process because you can't get to number 100 if you don't do rep 71. So you stay focused on that process. And his friendly reminder is what allowed me to finish that. It took me four hours to go up and down the hill a hundred times, and I was only able to do it by staying present. Now, if I could get the lovely AV folks to put up the last slide, I'm going to tell you one final story. But first, can you guys please give a hand to the AV team? You all as attendees may not know this, but I know Jordan and myself know how important their work is to our livelihood and to what we do. Do you guys know when you are at an event like this, do you know the only time that you even know the AV team is here? Is when they mess up. That's the only time, and you guys have been absolutely masterful this whole time. The only time you know they're here is when they mess up. Think about that for a second. The success of their livelihood is dependent on an entire room full of people not even knowing they exist. Their contribution to this event, which is massive, is done during the unseen hours. This is the concept that I'm going to talk about in my breakout session right after this. I have a session down at 2 o'clock in room 320 about building unbeatable teams. And a huge part of that is making sure we value, praise, respect, and appreciate what the members of our team do, especially those that do the vast majority of their work and their contribution during the unseen hours. I'm a keynote speaker and an author, but the moniker that I most resonate with is a coach. I'll be a coach to the day that I die. And part of being a coach means my job is to help support and empower you to get to a level that you don't believe you're capable of getting to on your own. If I did my job today with this keynote and, and with the following breakout session, at best, I planted a few seeds, and I reminded you of a few things that you already knew. It's not lost on me. I have the humility to know that every single thing I just shared with you all, you already knew all of that stuff intuitively and intellectually. But I've also been around long enough to know you may not be doing it. And if I can ever be of service to you or any member of your team to help you start closing that performance gap between what you know and what you do, it would be my honor to do it. If you use that QR code uh, or you text the word AWARE to that number, it'll send you a landing page with a curated list of free resources to help supplement the stuff that I'm sharing today. And I encourage you to pass that on to the members of your team, anyone that wasn't here. When I started my presentation, I was talking about the Kobe Bryant Skills Academy. What I did not tell you guys was there was a very special college counselor there. Now, we didn't know he was special at the time because he lacked the physical stature and the resume of the other college counselors, but there was something about this kid, and it was different. It was palpable. The most impressive of these traits was at the end of the first workout, and we did two workouts per day. Each workout was about three hours. They were really intense and really grueling. At the end of the first workout, he tapped me on the shoulder, and said, coach, will you rebound for me? Because I don't leave the gym until I swish five free throws in a row. Swish five free throws in a row. For any of you that have never shot a basketball before, just know that is a very high standard. A swish, by definition, is a perfect shot. It doesn't touch the rim. It doesn't touch the backboard. It gets its name from the sound it makes by going nothing but net. And this young man was not going to leave until he swished five in a row, which means he could have swished four in a row, hit just a little bit of the rim on the fifth one. It would still go in. He'd still be mathematically perfect. He'd still be five for five, but that wasn't good enough for him. He'd start over. And if memory serves, it never took him longer than 15 minutes to swish five in a row. That young man was Stephen Curry of the Golden State Warriors, who will go down in history as the greatest shooter the game has ever seen. And it's not by accident. It's not by luck. 
It's not even because his dad played in the NBA. It's because he's willing to hold himself to unparalleled standards. And that is a thought that I want to leave you with. The standards that you set today, personally and professionally, the standards you set today individually and organizationally, the standards you set today will determine who and where you'll be tomorrow. Now, before I take a final bow, I want to ask you all for your help on something. I need you to set down your phone, set down your drinks. I need your hands free. All you're going to have to do is clap. I know you're capable of it because I heard it before. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you very basic instructions for a very basic task. My left palm is facing up. When my right palm crosses over my left palm, I want you all to clap. But I don't want to hear 492 separate claps. I want to hear one clap, one voice. Let's end on a high note before we disperse and go to the breakout sessions. All right, everybody got your hands ready? I'll go slow, just in case some of you are a little bit slow. All right, you guys ready? OK. Hang on. Basic instructions, basic task. I would not fly all the way to Des Moines from Washington, DC, and leave you all hanging like that. I believe in you, I trust you, and I care about you. Let's do this one more time, and I know you got it, and then we'll, take, we'll, we'll go to our break for the breakout sessions. All right, everybody get ready. You got this. I believe in you, I trust you, and I know you can do it. OK, as you guys can see, you still have some work to do, so let's do it. Thank you guys so much. I hope to see some of you at the breakout session. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you.